As many of you already know, the Earth has different layers, with the uppermost layer and the part we live on being the crust. Under the crust we have the mantle, which makes up the largest part of the Earth by volume, followed by the outer and inner core. But for today, we're going to be focusing on the crust and upper parts of the mantle, and exploring a couple of different layers and terms that you may not have heard of before. This diagram I made shows the upper and lower parts of the crust, as well as the upper mantle, and this is where we're going to be focusing for today. First off, there are two different basic types of crust found on the Earth. In the oceans, we have oceanic crust, which is basaltic in composition and has a higher density, and on land, the part we live on, we have the continental crust, which is granitic in composition and has less of a density than oceanic crust. Below the continental and oceanic crust begins the mantle. However, there is a term for a layer that makes up the entire crust as well as the upper parts of the mantle. This is called the lithosphere and makes up the entire crust and upper mantle. The lithosphere is a relatively cool but solid part of the earth and makes up the earth's outer shell. The lithosphere will have a variety of thicknesses on the planet. In some areas, the lithosphere will be several hundred kilometers thick, while in other areas it will be relatively thin. Below the lithosphere is another part of the Earth's mantle called the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere begins directly below the lithosphere, and it is also more hot and softer than the lithosphere. Where the asthenosphere and lithosphere meet is a very weak zone, and they are disattached from one another, which allows the lithosphere to glide over the top of the asthenosphere. This is why the continents move over millions of years. Also in this boundary between the two is a small amount of melting that occurs. It is also worth mentioning that the asthenosphere is mostly solid. It is overall solid. It is a common misconception that the mantle is molten. In fact, the only completely molten layer in the Earth is the outer core. Together, the asthenosphere and the bottom portion of the lithosphere make up the upper mantle. Processes in the interior of the Earth, as well as the weak zone in the lithosphere and osthenosphere boundary, are what help drive continental movement and plate tectonics. I'm sure most of you are familiar with or have heard of the supercontinent Pangaea, and I'm sure you've also seen the illustration of how the continents appear to fit together like puzzle pieces. It's easy to see it here with South America and Africa. It looks like, at one time, they were connected, and that's because they were. However, plate tectonics is a relatively new theory, and it wasn't widely accepted until around the 1950s and 60s. Alfred Wegener was one of the first to suggest the movement of the continents. In 1915, he published a book titled The Origin of Continents and Oceans, in which he outlined his hypothesis of continental drift. However, Alfred Wegener was not the only person to notice that the continents appeared to have once fit together. People have noticed this as far back as the 1600s, and one of these people was Edward Seuss, who died one year before Alfred Wegener published his book. Besides just looking at the map and the appearance that it looks like that the continents once had fit together, there is more evidence found in the hard rock within the continents themselves. Fossils of animal and plant life have been found on multiple continents, such as Mosasaurus, which has been found in South America as well as Africa. Glossopterus, which is another fossil, has been found in Africa, India, and Antarctica. To explain how this happened, it is easy to see that continental drift possibly separated these animals or animal fossils apart from one another as the continents split. However, there were some other ideas, such as rafting, that the animals just simply rafted over to the different parts of the continent, or land bridges, where they walked from one continent to another. However, there was even more further evidence found on the continents to suggest that they were once together, besides fossils. Mountain ranges can be pieced back together to show that they were once one large mountain range. At first glance, mountains in Africa, the British Isles, Scandinavia, Greenland, and the Appalachian Mountains all appear to be separate mountain ranges. But when you put the continents all back together, it is easy to see that at one time they were all pieced together as one large mountain range. Another piece of evidence is when looking at past climates. In South America, Southern Africa, India, and Southern Australia, you can find evidence of past glaciation ice sheets that were once covering these areas. Now it's hard to imagine glacial ice covering South Africa and Australia, but at one time when the continents were in different locations and pieced together, 
they were more located near the southern pole, which then makes sense why there was glacial ice. All these things combined together are strong evidence of continental drift, but the question remains, how are the continents moving? After World War II, they began mapping the Atlantic Ocean to look for lost submarines. Eventually, they discovered the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is a mountain chain that runs from the North Pole down to the South Pole. When they made the map, they eventually got back a picture of the ocean floor. However, it was striped in repeating colors of reverse polarity. Oceanic crust is made of basalt, and basalt contains iron. When basalt lava is still molten, the iron within it is still influenced by the Earth's magnetic field. The iron particles within the lava will align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field, and when the basalt solidifies, that pattern is forever trapped within the rock, which then shows where the lava was when it solidified in relation to the Earth's magnetic field. Throughout the Earth's history, the Earth's magnetic field has flipped many, many times over, with the North and South Pole flipping and changing locations. When basalt erupts after a pole flip, it will have a reverse polarity. When the poles flip again, and basalt erupts once more, it'll have a normal polarity. This back and forth flipping of the poles, as well as the constant eruptions of basalt on the ocean floor, have created this striped pattern. It was also noted that as you traveled away from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the basalt got older, and the closer you got to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the basalt was younger, which then showed that new oceanic crust was being made in this mountain range, and that the sea floor was spreading apart and new magma was filling the gaps, creating new crust. We now know that the Earth is made up of seven different tectonic plates. Where a tectonic plate meets another tectonic plate, these are tectonic plate boundaries, and there are different types depending on the movement. There are divergent, convergent, and transform plate boundaries. At these plate boundaries is where you'll find most of the Earth's volcanic activity, as well as most of the Earth's earthquake activity. So first, let's look at divergent plate boundaries. Divergent plate boundaries are where the crust is basically being split in two. This causes mantle upwelling, which then rises up towards the crust and causes partial melting. The melt, or magma, eventually reaches the surface, creating new crust. An example of a divergent plate boundary is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is where, again, the continents are being split apart and you have rising mantle material creating melt and that melt then erupts at the surface as basaltic lava creating new oceanic crust over time. And this process continues for millions and millions of years, which slowly drives the movement of the continents. The next type of plate boundary, which can often be found associated with Divergent plate boundaries are transform plate boundaries. These are areas where the continents are simply sliding past one another. Transform plate boundaries and transform faults can create obvious offsets. You can see one of these offsets here when looking at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The ridge suddenly jumps over to the left here. That is because the transform plate boundary has slid this part this way and the other part this way. There are two different types of these movements. One is left lateral and one is right lateral. An easy way to tell the difference is imagine you're standing here and looking across this way. It appears that the mountain ridge has moved to the left. Thus, it is a left lateral transform movement or left lateral fault. Transform plate boundaries do not only occur in the ocean but also on the continental crust on the surface as well. A good example of this is the all-familiar San Andreas Fault. Looking at satellite images, you can spot the offsets created by the San Andreas Fault here in California. You can see that this mountain range suddenly ends, but the other half of it is over here, because the Transform Fault has offset it. Again, Transform Plate Boundaries, or Transform Faults, are side-to-side -side movement, or shear movement. In this diagram, you can see that the fault has offset the roadway, as well as the river, with side-to-side -side motion. The last type of plate boundary is convergent plate boundary, and there are three different types of these boundaries. There are continental, continental convergent plate boundaries, oceanic, continental convergent plate boundaries, and oceanic, oceanic convergent plate boundaries. Let's start off by looking at oceanic, oceanic convergent plate boundaries. 
This is where two different continents made up of oceanic crust are coming together in a collision. Typically, the denser of the two oceanic crusts will end up diving below the other one, in a process called subduction. The subducting plate over time will dive deeper into the upper parts of the mantle, creating earthquake activity as the two grind against each other. Subduction also generates melt, as the subducting plate travels deeper into the mantle, water trapped within the basalt flashes to steam, lowering the melting temperature of the asthenosphere, generating magma. The magma will begin to make its way to the surface, and eventually erupt from a volcano, creating a volcanic island arc. An example of this is the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. Here you can see the volcanic arc very clearly as a chain of islands, and here we have the subduction zone, where the oceanic crust is subducting below the other oceanic crust, eventually creating the volcanic island arc we see here. It is the oceanic-oceanic convergent plate boundary that has created this volcanic island arc that stretches on for several hundreds of miles. Next, we have the oceanic continental convergent plate boundary. This is where oceanic crust is colliding with continental crust. Since oceanic crust is more dense than continental crust, it easily subducts below it. Similar to oceanic-oceanic convergent plate boundaries, continental oceanic convergent plate boundaries also generate melt, and the magma will reach its way to the surface and erupt from a volcano, creating a volcanic continental arc. An example of a continental volcanic arc is the Cascade Mountain Range, which hosts several Cascade volcanoes. Likely the most famous of the Cascade volcanoes is Mount St. Helens, as well as other volcanoes that make up the Cascade Range, like Mount Adams, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, and others like Glacier Peak and Mount Baker. Volcanoes in the Cascade Range extend all the way from Northern California all the way up into Washington and parts of Canada. Finally, we have continental and continental convergent plate boundaries. These are locations where two continents are colliding with one another, and since both have the same lighter density, neither one of them wants to subduct. So instead, mountain ranges are built as they shove into each other and push down into the mantle as well as upward, creating mountains. An example of this type of collision is found in the Himalayas, where the Eurasian Plate and the Australian India Plate are colliding into each other, creating the Himalaya Mountain Range, which is where you can find the highest elevation point on Earth, Mount Everest. It is these powerful mantle processes that help drive plate tectonics and create all these different types of plate boundaries, which then in turn influences how our planet looks on the surface, from high towering mountain peaks to erupting volcanoes. So I hope this video helped you get a better understanding of the Earth's mantle and the forces that drive plate tectonics and the different types of plate boundaries. A lot of work and time went into this. I created most of the illustrations using paint, which uh, was very tedious. And uh, if any of you know any other better program out there that I could use instead of paint to make these types of geological animations, let me know in the comments. As long as it's not too complicated, I could probably figure it out. But anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this video, and this was another learning geology video. I hope I can make more here as soon as possible, and I hope this video was helpful to you. So, this will conclude the video. Thank you for watching. Catch you all in the next one. Take care.